every time I strike in my bagpipes, I ask myself a question, which is, what am I going to play today? But that's the yes. wrong question. I should be asking myself other questions. What questions should I be asking myself? Well, I mean, so uh, I think it's important to have fun stuff that you want to play today, but it's kind of like, you know, if you're going to go up in an airplane and you want to practice your loop de loops, right? So that can be the <laughs> that can be the thing that you want to that can be the thing that you want to do when you get up in the airplane. However, there's a few things that you probably want to double check before you worry too much about the loop de loops. I right? like that a little little pre-flight, a little pre-flight. It's a pre-flight. Check. Yeah, you want to do your pre-flight checklist, right? And I'm not a pilot, but you could probably imagine what a few of these things might be, right? Like for example, is there enough gas in the tank? Cuz we don't yeah. want to get up in the air and run out of fuel, right? That seems pretty key, yeah. That would be bad. So we want to check the gas tank and we probably want to what are those the flappy things? We probably think, want to check. Yeah, they usually make those go up and down a few times. I think yeah. that's a thing I've seen in movies, like, yeah. If one of the if they don't work, it's going to be a lot more difficult to land the plane. Although I'm sure they, I'm sure real pilots like know how to cope with such a situation. Or if one of them gets stuck in like the right turn only position, you're going to mm. be you're going to be in trouble. I guess I don't know. Anyway, yeah, you probably want to <laughs> you probably want to double check those things. And some of the things you double check might surprise you. If we were to learn to become pilots, Jim, I'm sure there's elements of the checklist that you're like, huh. Yeah, never would have guessed. Wouldn't have thought of that. Being suspended in midair going a thousand miles an hour is actually a pretty apt analogy to Mm. playing bagpipes in front of an audience, isn't it? It's like, let's hope this thing hangs on, right? Let's hope that this thing is actually going to function for me throughout my performance. And the other thing is you wouldn't want it to be so physically exhausting to operate your airplane that you can't focus on being able to maneuver, Right. That is and the I, truth. Yeah. I, I think the same is true when you're piping. Mm-hmm. When you're piping, you, you, we can't be in physical pain all the time when, when we're playing. We can't be just struggling to maintain a sound in, out of the instrument because if we are, then doesn't that sort of miss the entire purpose of what we're trying to do here, which is to create music and to express ourselves and to do fun mm-hmm. things. Maybe you're doing it with your band or maybe you're doing it by yourself or whatever. But if, you are just physically overwhelmed the entire time. Nothing after that makes any sense at all. Yeah, hey, how was just... hey, how was your hey Jim? How was your performance today? Honestly, no idea. I was just yeah. happy to survive. Have you ever had that feeling? Like, geez, just glad to get yeah. through that one. I have had that feeling, and it strikes me as funny too. Like how many times when talking with like other musicians who are going to be in a show or with show directors and stuff, that a, a variation on the phrase. Once I start, I just have to keep going comes up. It really yeah. does feel like an airplane thing where it's like, once I take off, that's it. I'm just going to plow through. And yeah, making sure that I'm going to be able to take off successfully and have a successful flight. It feels like a pretty good metaphor that we stumbled into here, Andrew. I like that. Which sort of leads me to my next thing, right? Which is, hmm, if the airplane pilot didn't have any sort of checklist what are the odds something might get missed? I don't know. I don't know anything about airplanes. I just want a disclaimer. I don't know anything about about airplanes at all, but it seems to me like there's a lot of knobs and gadgets. And it seems to me if you didn't have a system for remembering which gadgets needed to be doing what at any given time, the likelihood that you would forget something or overlook something would be fairly high, right? Oh, I forgot to turn that knob. And now we're like just taking a nosedive towards this beautiful mountain here. Yeah. And ever fly over the mountains, Jim? I mean, you're from the mountains. All the time. Yeah. Fly over the mountains and you're like, man, if we were just like 2,000 feet that way, (laughs) we would just be like in a ball of flames. You ever think that when you fly? I I think about that all the time. Every single time I fly. Yes, actually. So I'm glad that the pilots have a checklist in that case because, you know, uh, it seems like it would be pretty easy to overlook things. But anyway, my point is, I think the, the bagpipe is very much the same way. So when you say bagpipe maintenance to somebody, they're like, okay, cool. Bagpipe maintenance. Yeah. Like I got my roll of hemp and I'm going to wrap it a couple of times. So oh, that thing seemed a little bit loose. And it's like, yeah, that's my bagpipe maintenance. And then I guess like sometimes I got season my bag or whatever, or n- nuke yeah. my kitty litter or. Squirt uh, some oil on the drones or something. Oh yeah. Oiling is part of bagpipe maintenance, right? I don't know. I guess it is, but I, I wouldn't count that's... it. A, it's not in my checklist. It was something that you're going to do every year when Carl Donnelly gives you 
crap about it. But yeah, but that, it's not I think actually on my list. That's And maybe it's just me, Andrew, but I feel like that's a really good point. If anybody else is like me, where when we hear bagpipe maintenance, we think to ourselves, I oiled my pipes in the last year. I'm right. good. Yes. We're not thinking the right kind of maintenance, are we? <laughs> exactly. So my direct definition of bagpipe maintenance is anything that has to do with the air tightness and efficiency of the instrument. That's my definition. That's how I narrow it down. Now there's other things too, but anyway, going back to the oiling, right? That doesn't have anything directly to do with air tightness or efficiency, right? Mm. So that's not in my list. I'm not by any means suggesting that oiling your pipes isn't a good thing to do from time to time. I honestly don't particularly hold strong opinions one way or the other on oiling, but let's leave that for another show, right? Oiling doesn't have anything directly to do with it. Interestingly, the tuning slides don't either. You know, the, you know how people show up to bag, uh, bagpipe band practice and they've got their They've got their tuning slides and they're all loose and sliding around and stuff. Mm -hmm. But And obviously we don't want that. But the air has already left your instrument by that point. Yeah. So that doesn't have anything to do with air tightness or efficiency. And so that's not on my direct checklist either. It's something that I'll figure out as soon as I start to try and tune my pipes. So yeah. that tuning slide is too loose. I better fix that. But it's not in my pre-flight checklist. It's not something I do because I want to keep it focused on air tightness and efficiency. Those are the two big things, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what we really want to do here when bagpipe maintenance means we don't want to waste a single molecule of air. We don't want to waste a single bit of effort going out of the bagpipes other than through the reeds uh, mm -hmm. to produce the sound. So you can picture, okay, we only want the necessary amount of air to go through the reeds and that's mm -hmm. it. Okay. And that helps you that helps you think about what your pre-flight checklist might look like once you have that sort of standard. And then what mm -hmm. I like to do, where the four questions of bagpipe maintenance, otherwise known as my pre-flight checklist, that I'm going to do every time I take off my airplane or my bagpipe, right? It's going I'm going to trace the air as it goes through my instrument, okay? And then I'm going to check off all of the spots air could possibly leak. Mm -hmm. as I go through and I'm going to make sure, and I'm going to test for the fact that air is not leaking. So I brought props, Jim. I brought props nice. today. Nice. So we this is my, uh, aids. this is my first prop. By the way, this is my, this has been sitting here for five or six minutes. It's already pretty airtight. But for my our first listening question, audience, here's Andrew with his oh, Christmas goose. He's got if, his bag. If you're listening up. and you can't see, this is what bugs me. When I'm mm -hmm. listening and I can't see, you know what I do later? I say to myself, huh? This is going to be one I want to go back and watch. And then I just do that. I don't need, Jim, you don't need to explain to people that. I'm uh, not explaining anymore. You, yeah. Don't explain to these listener people. <laughs> don't explain to them. I, we like them. They're great. But come on. So yeah, anyway, yeah, I'm blowing up my pipe bag right now. But uh, anyway, the air is, and I have it all corked off and I'll explain why in a second. But the air is coming in from my mouth through the blowpipe, right? Goes through the blowpipe. There's a non-return valve here somewhere in the blowpipe. I don't know exactly where anymore. Newfangled technologies. And then it's going into the bag. Okay. And so that's phase one, right? We got, we're getting air into the bag. So the first thing I'm going to do on my pre-flight checklist, question number one, is my bag airtight? Okay. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I'm going to cork everything off. I'm going to blow it up. I'm going to make sure everything is nice and airtight. You can hear so step one is I'm going to apply as much effort as I possibly can blowing air into this bag. So you're just blowing it up as tight as you can as, get it. Yeah, it's not that you're like squeezing the bag, you're just blowing it really hard. Gotcha. Exactly. Now at this point, my bag is pretty good to go, but it's very common. You'll hear a little hissing sound coming mm -hmm. out of the blowpipe. Now remember, even though we're talking about the bag, the blowpipe and especially the non-return valve, that's part of that system. So that should all get thought about in step one. Okay, now the way I'm going to test this is I'm going to blow it up as tight as I can. And it's been about 30 seconds or so since last mm -hmm. time I blew air into it, right? So now I'm just going to make sure after about 30 seconds, I can't get any more air in. And I mean, maybe I can get, I don't know, like a tenth of a breath in, but I hurt myself. I don't, you ever get that mm -hmm. weird pain in the back of your cheeks? Yeah, yep. Uh, I, I hurt know. myself trying to get more air in. Yeah. So at least for now, if I was playing a sheep, this is a, my wintertime synthetic bag, but if I was playing my sheepskin bag, I wouldn't even be able to get that much air in. 
That's the great thing about hide bags. I find they can get even tighter than synthetic bags. Just what I find. So anyway, that's the basic idea here with that. Okay, so if you have any leaks at this stage, you want to troubleshoot that now. We don't have to move on to the next step. If the bag's not holding air, that's cool. That's grounding the plane until we sort that out. We Do not stop, proceed. Stop. Yeah. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Worth checking the corks at this point too. Sometimes the leak is at the point of the cork, so that's yeah. that's one thing. Make in, absolutely sure those corks are really tight. Stick the cork in and give it a twist. That's mm. how I do it. By the way, once you're into hide bags and seasoning and everything, it starts to become extremely urgent that you put those corks in tightly so you don't spray <laughs> yeah. seasoning all over the place. But that's the basic idea, and you can see. This puppy is still pretty tight. Um, it's also the middle of the winter here as we're recording this, and it's very dry. So the drier the climate, I feel like the harder it is to get like that perfectly airtight setup. But that's the first question of bagpipe maintenance. The bag's got to be airtight, okay? And by airtight, like really tight. Like no air is leaking out of there. Zero mm -hmm. air. Like if you were taking a spacewalk in outer space, how much leakage of air would be acceptable to you? Mm. I would prefer zero, so right. just as exactly. little as possible, yeah. And it's quite doable, right? It doesn't take any, any great talent to get a, a bag to be airtight, right? Anybody can do this, and we got to make sure that we do it. So question number one in my mind, is my bag airtight? Cool? All right. The next question, okay, I'm going to continue to trace the air as it would pass through the instrument, right? Once it has left the bag, where does it go next? I don't know about you, Jim, but I'm going to head up the stocks. And the first potential place for leakage I'll find in my stocks are, are the joints where the instrument like connects to the bag. Okay. Yeah. And I call those joints. I don't know. I guess you can call them whatever you want. By the way, sometimes it's brought up if you have a giant crack in your stock, okay, then air could leak before it gets to the joints. Yes. But you would discover that leak during phase one of the, mm -hmm. during question one, because you'd have the corks in and the bag would be leaking like a sieve, and then eventually you would hear like a hissing coming out of one of the stocks and you would find that crack, right? Or the same goes if your tie-in isn't tight or right. whatever, or if you have a hole in your bag or if your zipper needs to be lubricated or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. that, that was all taken care of in step one. So now we're moving on to the joints. This is the next place where things could be leaking, okay? So take the cork out. And what we want to make sure is that no air can leak through these joints. All right, so mm -hmm. our test for that is going to be, it should take a good amount of elbow grease to get this in and out, okay? Mm -hmm. It should take a good amount. Now, for me, because I'm an absolute beast and I'm mm. super strong, um, it might be a little bit more than, let's just say it for you, Jim. Fair enough. Just kidding. And this you, is, look this like is... you, could, you, you look like you <laughs> could secretly deadlift like 900. <laughs> Very secretly. So secretly, not even I know about it. <laughs> so anyway, yes. I don't know if you could see that, right? So it's it takes it's a frame, good yeah. amount of force to get it in and out, okay, of the stock. Should you use waxed hemp? Should you use unwaxed? For the purposes of the pre-flight checklist, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that it takes a good amount and it's not loose, right? If you can just grab mm -hmm. it and pull it out, that's too loose. Air is, some, at least some air is going to sneak through that joint instead of going through the reeds like it's supposed to. So we want it to be nice and tight. We want to take a good little bit of elbow grease. The one exception to that rule is the chanter joint, okay? So the chanter joint, it can't take tons and tons of elbow grease because if it takes all the elbow grease in the world to get it in and out, you're either going to end up uh, crushing the reed, taking it out because you just you have to have so much force that you're just going to crush it, or... Uh, it's going to be so tight, you're going to accidentally grab it by the bottom and just snap your chanter snap in your two chanter. pieces or something. Yeah. So with the chanter, or, uh, or your best sense friend's rule. chanter yeah. that you borrowed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, we'll leave those. Come on. We'll save those horror stories for another. Yeah. But uh, what was I going to say? Ah, yes. So common sense rule applies. So with the chanter, it can't be so tight that you can't get it in and out without risking the read. Okay. But it still has to be tight enough that you're 100% confident that no, no sneaky little air molecules are going to sneak out of the joint instead of through the reeds themselves. So that's mm -hmm. question number two. Really super simple. And question, at that point, if I do have a problem at question number two, the answer is hemp, right? Yeah, I mean, conceptually, I mean, you, you hear all sorts of different 
techniques that people use, the waxed hemp, the unwaxed hemp, the combination hemp, real beeswax that comes from, come from real bee butts, right? That's all fair game, <laughs> but the answer to the question needs to be yes, I'm sure those joints are airtight. I prefer the simplest possible method to get there. Other people prefer the, the most complicated possible method. Mm. It's all good as long as it happens. Now you go on to step three, Andrew, while I Google where does beeswax come from? <laughs> don't you don't want to Google it? No, <laughs> you'll get you'll get in trouble with your spouse if you Google that. Right. So anyway, yeah, step three is really simple. It's possibly the simplest of all the steps. However, usually when you first teach somebody this, they miss it. Mm. They miss this detail. But if we're tracing the air as it goes through the bagpipes, finding the the potential leaking points. After we've shared up the bag and the joints, what comes next? And people are like, no, 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 but that's maybe it, the reeds right? or something, right? Mm -hmm. There is, that's it. But the reed seats are next. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the reed seats are where the reed actually sits. By the way, I can't remember what order my tenor drones go in now, but, <laughs> but the reed seats, right? So this is, that's where the reed meets the instrument. Yeah. Okay. And that needs to be super nice and snug. If you were air, where would you want to go? Through through the outside or in through that tiny little space, you know, you'd, you'd want to go around if you could. So we've got to make sure these reed seats are tight. Okay, no wiggly reeds, nice and snug. Mine are so snug that I'm confident just holding the instrument by the reed and just waving it around. Watching you right? do this gives me the same kind of anxiety I get when at Dairy Queen, they flip my shake oh, yeah. upside down. <laughs> exactly. You don't have to do that. <laughs> exactly. So we got to Dairy Queen our reed seats. Common sense rule. You don't have to, you don't have, this is just a party trick. You don't have to be able to do that, but you want to know that it's really, really nice and snug and that it's yeah. not going anywhere. Same goes for the chanter reed. A lot of times we're in the band, our reed was sharp or something, so our pipe major raised the reed and the reed seed, but resultingly, they made the reed a little bit loose, okay? Mm. And so that is going to make your bagpipe less efficient, okay? So when if the pipe major is going to move the reed and the reed seat, you keep an eye on him or her, and you say, whoa, my reed's loose now. Wrap, wrap some hemp around that, you lazy bum. What the <laughs> heck are you doing? And then argue with your pipe major about what kind of hemp they're using. Yeah, it's, you can't, what? No, don't give me any of that black hemp. Give me the yellow hemp. Come on now. Yeah. So anyway, keep an eye on those reed seats. Kind of make sure that they're absolutely airtight. So uh, that that's the first three steps totally covered. It's really not that hard to do, right? It not feels very science. much like what we're doing is we're just making it, we're, we're like the idea is just, I'm not going to give air any choice. Exactly. But to escape via my reeds. There will be absolutely. no other option. Amen. And to me, that's the definition of bagpipe maintenance mm. is like you said, the air is going to go through those reeds and only those reeds. That's the mm. only chance. And the absolute minimum amount of mm. air is going to go through those reeds, which brings me to question number four. So to review question one, is my bag airtight? Question two, are my joints airtight? Question three, are my reed seats airtight? Those are all air tightness steps. Okay. And then the final step is the efficiency step. So we want to mm. make sure that the bagpipes are efficient. And this is a two-part question, okay? Beginning with the chanter reed, okay? So what we want to do is we want to make sure the chanter reed is taking the optimal amount of air for us. And we want to make sure that it's not taking too much air. And preferably, certainly if, and, and certainly if you have a pipe major who wants you to be contributing to the sound of the band. We don't want it to be taking too little air either. Mm. Okay. And so I just have a little litmus test. We call it the Scotland, the brave test. Okay. And what that means is before I put that chanter in the pipes, I want to make sure I can mouth blow my reed for a certain amount of time. So if I can't mouth blow my reed for a certain amount of time before I have to stop, that means that the reed is too hard. Exactly. And of course, if I can play, if I can like circular breathe mm. with it, like through my right nostril, okay, mm. it's probably too easy as well. But this is like a good test. Usually pipers end up in a situation where their reed's too hard for them. Yeah. Okay. So before I even let that reed go into the pipes, I'm going to do what I call a Scott and the Brave test, which is just making sure I can play my chanter for like 12 to 15 seconds with, without needing a breath. You want to try it? Yeah. I want to see this happen. And I, and I appreciate that you've attached a tune to it rather than if you said to me, you need to play your chanter for 12 to 15 seconds, I would just blast a low A and time it. And that yep, doesn't you seem can do as that. nice. Yeah, that's perfectly fair game. It's just awkward. 
But sometimes with beginners, they don't even really know Scott and the Brave yet, mm, or they're not that point. confident yeah. with it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be Scott and the Brave. It can be any any segment that's 12 to 15 seconds. And if you're a beginner, by all means, just set up the stopwatch and play low A. Like, that's mm -hmm. good for me. What we want to make sure is we can make it more than two seconds before we have to stop because the read's yeah. too hard. Anyway, here's me. So I can actually go a little bit beyond with this read. This is my very easy winter read. Hashtag off season, off season gym. Okay. So anyway, this read is not too hard for me. Okay. Now, uh, if a beginner played this read, they might find it was way beyond what they were capable of doing. Who knows? Everybody's different. And by the way, <laughs> I'm very different this time of year than <laughs> when I'm in shape during the summer months. And I've been playing like a nice hard read for a while and I've built up that sort of uh, that stamina and strength mm -hmm. and endurance and stuff like that. Okay. But that's what's got on the brave test. That means that chanter read is the right strength for me. Mm -hmm. If anything, it's probably a little on the easy side and that's, a, you know, that's okay. Easy side's better than a hard side, but yeah, we're looking for that sweet spot would be 10 or sorry, 12 to 15 seconds of being able to mouth blow that read mm -hmm. is what we want. Okay. That makes sure the chanter's not taking too much air. Okay. Now with the drone reads, we also want to make sure the drone reads are not taking too much air either. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we call that drone read calibration. We want to set the strength of the drone reads so that they don't take radically more air than necessary relative to the strength of the chanter read. So this is something that will change when I change chanter reads. Amen, my friend. So if, for example, if you have a band chanter and you have a solo chanter, if you have two different chanters that, you're, that you have going on, you would also probably want two different sets of drone reads as well. Mm -hmm. Either that or those two chanters are exactly the same strength or you're recalibrating every time you switch the reads back and forth, which we really mm -hmm. don't want to, we really don't want to get into. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but yeah, we want the, we want those drone reads to match in strength with the chanter read. There's a couple ways of doing this. And we're not going to get into all of them today, but I just blew that chanter read for 12 to 15 seconds. I've got a good idea of how hard that read's going to be. So my first recommended way to get started with drone read calibration is to make sure that when you mouth blow your read at a certain point, you can get that read to shut off. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you can get the read to shut off by mouth blowing it, that's a good indication that it's not radically too open and taking tons and tons of air. Okay. And to be so, clear, you mean shut off by blowing so hard that it gives up, yes. not by sticking your tongue on it or something like that, just to make it stop. Absolutely. That's a great point, Jim. Yeah. So I, and I Is like to do this with the drone tops on. So we want to get the drone top on here because drones tend to behave a little bit differently when the full column of air is yeah. implemented. So here I am with my drone top on. Okay. Note that your pipes do not have to be shined to do this. Hmm. And then I'm just going to mouth blow, put my mouth above the, above the bridles of the reed. I'm going to hmm. mouth blow on it. And I'm going to make sure that when I give it a little bit of oomph, like beyond what I would imagine my chanter reed takes, it should shut off for me. See how, see how that works. Mm -hmm. Give it a little mouth blow. And then when I go past the point that I would want to blow in real life, it should shut off for me. And you can do that for all three of your reads. The base read gets a little bit more difficult because the read is so long. You might have trouble yes. mouth blowing it. We could talk about ways to work around that, but that's the basic idea. That's it. If the read does not shut off for you, we can adjust the bridle of the read down, closing the aperture of the read a little bit. Okay. And that'll make it take less air and sh should shut off for you at a lower pressure. And the opposite is also true. So if you do a little bit of calibration, you fire up your pipes and suddenly that drone is shutting off on you and you're like, what the heck, man? No problem. You would stop and then take the drone out and recalibrate it open a little mm. bit. 
I went okay. too many years not knowing about this, Andrew, and I ended up with reeds that were functionally like vacuum cleaners, just sucking air out of my bag. Yes. Um, and For everything else was great. And I was doing the hard work to keep my bag seasoned and tied up tight and everything. And I just, it never even occurred to me until your friend and mine, Mike Swan, took me through the reed calibration process. And what a joy. It's, yes. it's it really is fun when you get it all locked in. It's pretty cool. And you can and should get more and more scientific with your calibration moving forward. So what I showed you there, that's like the absolute like elementary level way to just get started. But then from there, like I was saying the base drone read, okay, mm -hmm. can be really hard to mouth blow, but you don't need to mouth blow it. There's other ways of doing it. So let's say I get one drone read set the way I like it in mm -hmm. my pipes and it's not shutting off, and it's not shutting off, let's say, unless I blow way too hard on my reed and then it shuts off, then what you could do is you could take your bass drone, okay, cork off the middle tenor, let's say you have the one tenor you love and you got the bass drone going, gradually increase the pressure inside of the bag, just playing those two drone reeds, and make sure that the bass and the outside tenor shut off at the exact same pressure, mm -hmm. or at least very, very close to that, and that way, now you've matched the strength of your bass drone read to your outside tenor, right? And then you can do the same with the middle. And now you have three drone reads that all match, okay? And you could probably get even more scientific than that. You could, you know, you could take a pressure gauge and you could study all the pressures. And when the wind is blowing ever so slightly <laughs> to the east, northeast, that, that might change your coefficient and might need to multiply by the cosine or the sine. I can't quite remember which one, but, yeah. but you could get fancy about it, but start with the basics, like just conceptually knowing for sure that none of your drone reads are taking wildly too much air is going to be a big thing. So before I forget what my next thought was going to be. So to review, is my bag airtight? Are my joints airtight? Are my reed seats airtight? And are my reeds calibrated? Mm. Those are the four questions. And the, are my reads calibrated? That's a two-step process. Is my chanter read calibrated to my personal strength ability to blow it? Okay, that's part A. And then part B, are my drone reads calibrated then to the strength of the chanter read? That's our pre-flight checklist. Now, when you've made major changes to your pipes, or when you haven't played for a month, or two weeks before a really important performance, et cetera, et cetera, you can take those four questions and you can do a really deep dive, being ultra careful, being absolutely specific. And this process could take an hour. Okay. But what I love about the four questions is once I've done that a couple of times, once I'm playing every day, once I'm in a routine, for me, the four questions represents about 30 seconds at the beginning of each practice session. Okay. Where I can double check my four questions and then I'm off to the races. So bagpipe maintenance is a routine that I do every day for just about 30 seconds to make sure things are good to go. Example, I don't cork off my bag every single day, right? Most days, uh, if I'm playing the hide bag, I'm feeling it to make sure it still feels ooey gooey with the right amount of seasoning. There's no reason to believe anything's changed overnight. Then I check all the joints to make sure nothing's gotten super loose or super tight. I'm not gonna check the reed seats again unless I take things in or out at which point I can do a little wiggle check. And then the first thing I do when I blow up my pipes every day is I play the drones only for a little while. And at some point I'll increase the pressure and making sure all three of those drones still shut off at the same pressure, indicating nothing has changed much since last time I played. And now I'm off to the races. I can start mm -hmm. my practice chanter. I can start doing my figurative metaphorical loop-de-loops. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So the four questions is, you can, go, you can go quick or you can go deep. It's the same exact process I use all the time. It's beautiful. I love it. It's almost too good to be true, isn't it, Jim? <laughs> it really is lovely, though. I really, I, I get a lot of joy out of a Saturday afternoon when I take a little more time and double check the calibration of the reeds or something and get them really tight. But yeah, and absolutely. Then, it's like magic when your bagpipe is easy to play. It really is a cool thing. Yeah, for sure. And, and but then also, I'm I'm sure you would think. I'm sure you would also say that sometimes you ain't got time for that crap. Yeah, and absolutely. Good, That's why I say Saturday. Just have. Most days I don't. Yeah. Yeah, 
It, it, the four questions, it's really interesting. I think it's really interesting just to look back. And for me, it's just ingrained in my process. I do the four questions every single day, every single time I'm about to perform without fail. When you play at the Worlds, the first thing I do is the four questions, right? It really is. Here we are. We're about to play the MSR at the Worlds. I don't need to check my maintenance. I'm sure it's fine. I've been practicing all week. This is the Worlds. I play in Inverarian District. This is going to be great. No, it's not like that. It's just a habit. Bag is feeling good, right? Uh, checking the joints. Nothing got weird or loose or too tight, especially yeah, at the Worlds. If it's like a little bit rainy or something, those joints can tighten up on you. You don't want them to be too tight, especially those tuning slides. You don't want them to be too tight. Or the dreaded tuning slide is tighter than the joint, yeah. uh, which is a great way to get your butt cut. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just all these little checks. And then the first thing I do when I get the pipes going is I make sure the drones are still behaving the way I expect, mm -hmm. especially with cane drone reads that are likely to move around on you from time to time. You just, you're just making sure you're just doing those checks like the pilots. They know how to fly a plane, but they just double check because they don't want to die. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the problem. Terrible bagpipe performance doesn't kill you. If anything, it's kind of like the norm. People are expecting uh, to, people are expecting when they hear a bagpiper for it to sound terrible. So maybe we get complacent. We need higher stakes. Yeah, exactly. Like if death was the consequence of something going wrong with your bagpipe, I bet you people would take this. Real we'd seriously, all, do, all the we'd time. all take the four steps a little more carefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there you go. Four questions of bagpipe maintenance never fails. And if you do right, no can defense, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. It's been proven. More information, further learning about this process. We've got the, it, what do we do about that? We've got the cheat sheet. You can go to pipersdojo.com slash four questions and grab the cheat sheet. It's just like a quick review of the four questions. On a piece of paper, you can print it off. You can put it on your wall. Be sure to go there and grab it. Because how many it. dollars do I need to give to Piper's Dojo to get the cheat sheet? Zero dollars. It's free. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's free. You just uh, go over there. We'll send it to you. It's gonna be awesome.